My name is Benjamin Berger, and today I want to tell you about the mysterious extinction of the most successful group of mammals to have ever lived. Their duration in the fossil record is the longest among our nearest relatives, the mammals. Now, these are not marsupials, and they're not placental mammals, but a group distantly related to the monotremes, the group that uh, include the living platypus and echidna. But they look very different than the platypus or echidna and arose much earlier during the early Jurassic period and lived throughout the entire Jurassic and Cretaceous periods during the age of dinosaurs. But what is truly remarkable is that they also survive through the end Cretaceous mass extinction event 66 million years ago to go on and be a very successful group during the early Cenozoic, during the age of mammals. Now you may be wondering why these mammals are not found living today. Well, they mysteriously went extinct about 34 million years ago. And their ultimate extinction is a really fascinating topic, one that I am currently exploring research about. Now, this group of mammals that I'm speaking of uh, are called the multi-tuberculates. Uh, of course, you, you clicked on a link with them, actually in the title. <laughs> so you have been fore forewarned that I was going to be talking about these little extinct creatures called multi-tuberculates. Um, now, the mammalian group multi-tuberculata uh, is classified within the Allotheria, uh, along with the extinct Gondwanatheria and the Heramiidae. They're characterized by having cheek teeth with rows of small cusps or tubercles, which is where they get their name, multi-tubercles or multi-tuberculates. They also possess these massive lower premolars, which resemble a broad serrated circular blade. These posterior teeth are separated from the long pincher-like incisors by a long diastema or gap in the jaws that superficially resembles that of a rodent skull. Now, unlike rodents, the elongated incisors are not ever growing, um, but serve as kind of functional tweezers rather than uh, active gnawing as in uh, rodents. So, Multituberculates had a panual jaw stroke, which basically means that the motion of chewing was from the front to the back, uh, allowing them to slice the hard seeds and nuts by using the sharp edge of that blade-like tooth. And then with the crushing of the food accomplished by the use of the tubercles on the flat posterior teeth. Uh, the mastication of food was very different than that of rodents and rabbits, which utilize gnawing, uh, front, the gnawing front incisors with this back and forth and side to side transverse uh, motions of the lower jaws. So most of our knowledge of multituberculate anatomy uh, comes from the well-preserved skeletons of the Cretaceous of Mongolia in the same deposits that produce Velociraptor. In the Cretaceous, they show a, a wide diversity of skeletal adaptations such as digging and climbing and likely trying to escape from dinosaurs. And Cenozoic, uh, skeletons of Cenozoic multituberculates are rare, although there is one genus from the late Paleocene of Canada named Tilidus uh, that indicates arboreal behaviors for the Cenozoic Tiliodontidae group living in trees. And these uh, later Cenozoic multituberculates 
had ankle adaptations for a wide range of foot mobility, and they also had clawed toes that allowed them to descend uh, tree trunks head first, uh, a bit like living squirrels do. They also possessed divergent big toes, a helix, that could move independently from other digits, allowing them to hold slender branches, as well as possessing a long prehensile tail, making them highly specialized and excellent climbers in trees and very slender branches. Now, most Cenozoic multidibriculates are divided into two uh, major groups. Uh, the larger beaver-sized and ground-dwelling Taniolabiidae, and the smaller you know, chipmunk-sized uh, arboreal, arboreal tree-living uh, Tiliodontidae. Now, the Taniolabiidae, those the ground dwellers, they disappear at the end of the Paleocene epoch, but the Tiliodontidae continue into the Eocene epoch. Uh, in North America, the group is represented by four families, with two that persist into the Eocene epoch. These late occurring multi-tuberculates are members of the Eocosmodontidae and the Neoplagelacidae family. Now, the diversity of multi-tuberculates seems to be inver adversely affected by the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum event that occurred 55.5 uh, million years ago, which is a, a major global warming event. Yet most researchers dismiss this climatic event as the cause of their extinction simply because they persisted beyond this event into the Eocene. Uh, the other major idea is that the first appearance of rodents uh, led to their extinction. Now, rodents first um, appear in North America in the Paleocene epoch, and they become very diverse and common in the later Eocene. Now, in the early 1960s, uh, Peter Robinson and Greg Black and Mary Dawson from the University of Colorado Museum and the Carnegie Museum uh, discovered um, some multi-tuberculates from central Wyoming in the late Eocene, kind of when they were thought to have been long extinct at this point, with only a handful of specimens knowing, known from the early Eocene uh, previous to this discovery. Uh, so they were kind of thought to have gone extinct maybe 55 million years ago. But these were dated much younger, about 47, and others uh, later were found to date to 40 million years ago. And then since then, uh, rare occurrences of fossil multi-tuberculates have been found clear up until the late Eocene, about 34 million years ago. However, no Oligocene fossils of multi-tuberculates have been found yet. So the extinction of multi-tuberculates seems to be a more gradual decline uh, during the Eocene, rather than an abrupt, sort of sudden event. Um, and I'm very curious as to what caused this slow decline uh, and this extinction of this very successful group of mammals. Because if rodents were the cause of the extinction, you would expect them to go extinct with the first appearance of rodents in the late Paleocene. And if climate change caused their extinction, then you would expect them to go completely extinct at the Paleocene-Eocene boundary during the major global warming uh, uh, event. One of the clues is the strange occurrence of Eocene multi-tuberculates in the early Eocene of Colorado, where I've conducted field research. Um, now, to find these tiny multi-tuberculate uh, mammal uh, fossils, um, these rocks uh, are um, passed through <laughs> a screen and um, collected. Um, these were actually collected from an anthill. And these sand-sized particles 
uh, are then brought into the lab to be picked through uh, using a microscope or hand lens. Um, and since multituberculates have very distinct uh, teeth, isolated teeth when they are found uh, in these sand size sediments, they're very easy to identify. Um, this sediment here that I'm looking through uh, comes from ant hills that are located in a layer of rocks at the base of the Eocene in Colorado. And so far, we have not found any multituberculates uh, from these Eocene localities, despite many years of looking. Yet a few miles to the north, uh, near the border with Wyoming, Eocene multituberculates uh, fossils have been found, suggesting that maybe there was a difference in the habitat of the two close geographic areas. And my hypothesis to explain this strange biogeography has to do with the types of food uh, available to multituberculates, uh, and that's that's something that I'm very curious about. So my hypothesis to explain this strange biogeography has to do with the types of food that were available to multituberculates. And that's something I'm really curious about. Because multituberculates arose before the flowering plants and endosperm fruit. And I suspect that they specialize in eating gymnosperm seeds rather than going after berries, fruit, or hard nuts like other mammals. And using those tweezer-like teeth, they likely plucked the seeds from cones and fed on these sources of food. Now, pine cones are also a source of food for rodents, but rodents approach cones differently they gnaw or chew through the cone to get at the yummy seeds inside, which takes more energy. So during the Eocene, I suspect that these small multituberculates specialized in feeding on the tiny cones of deciduous gymnosperms that were common at that time. Now, deciduous gymnosperms include the dawn redwood, the Chinese swamp cypress, and the bald cypress. Many of these were the predominant tree in boreal forests of the northern hemisphere during the warm Paleocene and Eocene times. Now, these cones are dangled from slender branches that would require a specialized ability to hang on to the branches, tweezer-like little incisors to pluck out the seeds from the cone, and the ability to quickly eat and store the energy from these seeds, all while dangling <laughs> high up in the air from a tiny branch. Now, this behavior was not done by rodents, which may have had a broader diet focusing on hard nuts that they could gnaw through. This specialization for these tiny cones worked great for multituberculates. Well, until these forests began to disappear near the end of the Eocene. The Dawn Redwood, a common fossil in the Eocene, nearly vanished. The tree was thought to be extinct until it was discovered living in China in 1947. And since then, uh, trees have been reintroduced here into North America. Likewise, the Chinese swamp cypress, a, a common Eocene fossil, is highly endangered today and lives only in northern Vietnam, where it is nearly extinct. Now, both trees require uh, more water and warmer temperatures to survive. The colder, but probably more importantly, the drier climates of the Oligocene epoch 
likely resulted in the extreme decline of these types of forests. Today's boreal forests are predominated uh, dominated by uh, spruce, fir, and pine trees, which during the Eocene had a more southern distribution. Now to test this idea, what I'm doing is I'm compiling all the fossil localities where Eocene multidebriculates have been found and running a series of computer algorithms and comparisons to the bio biogeography of fossil plants that may have been their food source in order to draw correlation between certain forest habitats and uh, these extinct mammals. I'm also uh, go doing this with uh, rodents uh, to see how much overlap these Eocene multi-tuberculates had with Eocene rodents living at the same time. I know of lots of fossil localities where the two are found together and they may have exhibited niche selection in regard to the types of food that they ate. Now there's one other factor that may have may have doomed the multi-tuberculates because there was a new group of animals that appear appeared in the Oligocene. Uh, these animals go after the same seeds and are perfectly adapted to slender uh, branches. They arrived likely from Australia during the late Eocene and early Oligocene, right at the decline of multi-tuberculates. Since then, they have become one of the most common <laughs> animals that you will see in a forest today. These are the Passiformes, the songbirds. These birds possess an anal dactyl foot uh, with digits two, three, and four pointing forward and digit one pointing backward, allowing the bird to grip slender branches and with a narrow beak that can quickly pluck the seeds from any cone, no matter how small or tiny. These birds likely were able to get to these seeds before the climbing multi-tuberculates were able to do so. Now, there is no co-occurrence of passiform fossils and multi-tuberculates in the fossil record suggesting that their extinction may have been the result of the rise and success of this group of birds. Um, many other uh, seed-eating mammals, uh, like the microsiopids, uh, go extinct during this time as well, uh, towards the end of the Eocene. Now, the earliest fossils of these seed-eating birds are tentatively believed to date back to the Eocene of Australia, and they became widespread globally during the early uh, Oligocene with their introduction to northern continents, likely crossing Wallace's line and entering into Southeast Asia, and then eventually into North America. Many of the native North American birds during the Eocene uh, were carnivorous, uh, most were insectivorous, some were omnivores or fish eaters. However, there were a few that specialized in eating uh, nuts and seeds. Uh, within it, an extinct Eocene group called the Zygodactylidae uh, that have parrot-like feet or zygdactyl feet with four toes and two in the front and two in the back that can hold branches with a strong grip and are adapted to perching in trees. Now some paleoornithologists go so far to regard this family as the ancestor to Passiformes birds. So blaming the introduction of these seed-eating songbirds in the late Eocene may not be as clear-cut or a closed case in regard to their involvement in the final extinction of multi-tuberculates. Now, one amazing thing to think about 
is that it's not out of the question, but multi-tuberculates could still be living in forests today. And it would completely rock the scientific world if a living specimen could be found. In 2006, a previously believed extinct rodent family from the Miocene, uh, the Diatomidae, uh, was discovered still to be living in the forests of Laos. So it's not completely out of the question that the even smaller, you know, multi-tuberculate mammals could be found living in Southeastern Asia today. So um, Bigfoot searchers, if you if you have if you if you have another quest, one that's you know maybe a little bit more realistic than finding Bigfoot, and a little bit more challenging would be to find some living multi-tuberculates. That would be cool. Now the extinction of multi-tuberculates is an example of the interconnection between plants and animals. If a food source such as plants are lost through changes in the climate. That change is often felt by the animals that depend on those food sources for energy. Furthermore, the increased competition tends to drive niche separation. But when the same food source is exploited, uh, extinction can be very quick rather than gradual. And I think that this, this extinction of the multi-tuberculates is really important in our understanding of threatened and endangered animals living today. Animals that have survived for millions of years, but are not thriving today because of the loss of habitat. This makes today's animals very susceptible to extinction, especially with the introduction of non-native animals that compete for the same food sources. So, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, the weather is starting to warm up here in Utah, and I am very excited to get back into the field and traveling again. I really want to thank you uh, to all my supporters and viewers. Uh, this last year has been difficult to find time to make new videos and get outside to look for fossils, and my productivity has been in sharp decline. And I can see how many of my favorite YouTube creators have also had trouble making new videos for the channels during this difficult year. But I'm excited and hopeful to continue to share with you uh, some fun videos I have planned for the coming weeks. And I hope to get back to making twice monthly videos in a more consistent manner to keep you enthusiastic uh, about the science of paleontology. Um, I did not do a drawing for this week, but I am sending a little care pack to those of you who support me on Patreon at that level, because I, I want to thank everyone for your patience. I was scared that this year would be the slow decline of my YouTube channel into obscurity due, due to the lack of new videos. But I'm back and I have a major backlog of ideas that I want to explore this summer. So I hope to see you in the next video on the fossil record. Thanks for watching.